Hello, this is Graphic Policy Radio, and this is a comics podcast. This is your host, Ilana Levin. This is a comics podcast for the kind of readers who realized that the fact that congressional aide Amanda Waller runs Task Force X out of the legislative branch, as opposed to the executive branch, illustrates just how powerful she is. I mean, she doesn't even have to follow the separation of powers rules to do her thing. <laughs> you know, I- I'm going to admit, I- I'm going to admit, I-, I have actually used this intro before, possibly 10 years ago, but I'm bringing it back again because this time I have a very particular reason for it. I get to spend tonight talking about Amanda Waller with the other biggest Amanda Waller fan I know. He has been a friend for a long time, a friend of the podcast for a long time. You've heard him speak about things such as Punisher, Daredevil, X-Men in abundance, but now he's finally here to join me to talk about his own comic book. Spencer Ackerman is here, and we are excited to have him talking about Waller versus Wildstorm. Welcome back to the show and Muscles Hove. Thank you so much, Alana. It's been such a challenge to not spoil this book for you specifically, given how much, (laughs) including on this podcast, we have talked about Amanda Waller. It's so true. I, yes. So I'm very happy to do this. I'm going to give your bio to our listeners, but I'll say to anybody who's listening, we're going to keep the beginning of this podcast spoiler free because we know this is coming out right when the book is hitting the shelves and you might not have time to get to your local comic book store yet. So the beginning of this will be spoiler free. And when we get into spoiler territory, we will let you know and give you enough of a warning so you can make sure to go out there and buy Waller versus Wildstorm at your local comic book shop. So for those of you who are not already familiar with Spencer from his amazing work and also being on my show a lot, Spencer Ackerman is a Pulitzer Prize and National Magazine award-winning national security reporter and a new columnist for The Nation magazine. His book, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump, won an American Book Award and was rated a a 2021 Book of the Year by the Washington Post, New York Times, and the PBS NewsHour. Along with Evan Narcisse, he is the co-writer of the new DC slash Black Label miniseries Waller vs. Wildstorm with artist Jesus Marino and color artist Michael Atiyah. So w- welcome, welcome here. And I, I'm, I'm so excited. I was not at all surprised to love this comic. Thank um, you so much. And I really, really do. And I'm so excited that we get to talk about it and have other people look at it now after, you know, batting things back and forth for quite some time. So where's the wait? I mean, thank you so, so much. Like the fact that you as not just a fan of Amanda Waller, but a protector of Amanda Waller, (laughs) you know, had this book click with you is just so affirming and validating because this is, you know, this is my first comic book. I'm not really known for fiction writing, you know, peanut gallery jokes about my journalism side. And so, you know, this was something of, of me taking a risk and, yeah. Also, you know, I think a lot of us who are, you know, comics lifer readers have at some point like thought to themselves, like, maybe I could do this. You know, mm-hmm. do I have an idea that's something that could sustain, in this case, a miniseries? And I've never, you know, put that to the test before. So Waller versus Wildstorm is really a kind of show and prove moment, I think of it for myself and what. I might be capable of doing in comics. And so it is really, I mean, you know, my anxiety speaking for a moment, really Mm -hmm. relieving (laughs) Alana that you like this book. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I, I definitely associate you with these characters in particular because, I mean, my first association with Amanda Waller was from the DC animated TV shows. And I, I, I feel like, there's a number of characters who I get into through this book that I think I first read because you loaned me your gigantic Teen Titans tome at mm. one point many years ago. So yes, hint um, hint. If yeah. yeah, if you're if you're a fan of the Wolfman Perez Teen Titans, there's going to be something specifically in this for you. Yes, very much so. 
So I kind of feels like a little bit full circle because like you helped me get into this and, you know, I, it's, it's interesting as many times as you've been on the podcast, I've never talked to you about your history in comics extensively, or maybe I have, but it was a decade ago. Who can say? Exactly. So I, I do want to kick off while also endorsing folks should go back and listen to those episodes. I'm very proud of them. I do want to say like for our listeners who might not be familiar with, about your history and love of comics, like how did you start reading comics? And how did you fall into this corner of DC Universe reading in particular as well? Well, thank you so much for that question. It's a really cherished memory of mine. I learned how to read in large part because my mom read me the Bill Mantlow run of of Incredible Hulk in the (laughs) early 1980s. Why? She latched on to those books in particular, I don't really know. She was an omnivorous reader, and and I always tried to follow that example. And with her, you know, blessing of comics and her enthusiasm, you know, she would act out all of the characters, and, and I absolutely loved it. That just mm-hmm. made me want to, it made me also want to read books from other stuff that we would read together. But it really just made me, always associate comics with, you know, wonder and love and inquisitiveness. And I've just sort of never fallen away from that. You know, like a lot of people, when I was a teenager to when I was in well, pretty well into my, my 20s, when you just don't have any money, yep. I stopped, you know, <laughs> primarily reading comics and just sort of, you know, reread, you know, my old collection from time to time with the exception of like some stuff that friends of mine would say, like, you really got to check this stuff out. And some of that stuff was the really amazing kind of spy stuff that Wildstorm was doing in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And mm-hmm. my, my original associations with Wildstorm stuff was very much like the era of image comics that we're now celebrating like 30 years of, in which, like, that stuff in Wildstorm was kind of, in, in, you know, it was always there. Like, you can see it starting from Stormwatch number one, starting, you know, the seeds of it you can definitely see come to think of it in, you know, the, the very first Jim Lee issue of Wildcats. But by the time it got to the, the late 90s and early 2000s, you know, that was, you know, the Stormwatch book in particular you know, that was something that that seemed to be, you know, doing something really thrilling in terms of showing how a spy series could work within superhero logic. And I'm a national security reporter. And these have, you know, been questions I've, you know, been interested in about particularly, I've had a career only in, in the post 9-11 era, mm-hmm. when I've reported on these you know, really enormously, you know, high stakes struggles, manipulations, deceptions, and ultimately effects on human beings of spy agencies and the, you know, grand strategies and economic interests that they serve. And because I've just sort of, perhaps not for my entire life, but for most of my life, and certainly as I see myself, you know, a capital C comics, capital R reader, I've always sort of thought to myself as I've been reporting on this stuff, definitely when I was reporting on the Edward Snowden NSA stuff, well, how could this work in a superhero universe? <laughs> and and like, you know, sometimes I did that to kind of like keep my sanity when reporting on really bleak stuff, but also because like I've just always sort of thought that way as as a kind of comics lifer. And with enormous gratitude, I've now gotten to to kind of take sort of both my professional life and my comics reading life and have that inform each other. It's so interesting because when it comes to fictional works, talking about the topics that connect to your professional life, it can really cut both ways. Sometimes it's so removed and farcical that you're just like, this is, this is a turnoff and it's missing the point. And I like, this is not for people who know what they're doing. 
and then sometimes you're like, this is this, I, oh, wow, they're looking at the work that I do through this, like, you know, exaggerated comics genre lens. And now I really, really have to make sure I read it. And it's sort of interesting where this sort of falls on the too close to home or too far off the mark when you're thinking about reading the extreme era of comics in the Wildstorm era, while also, you know, working and writing and documenting these, these things as a journalist? Well, I, I came at a certain point first to decide, like, I definitely didn't want to set Waller versus Wildstorm in the time period of stuff that I cover. I wanted to have sort of those themes mm. resonate, but, you know, it, it, it would be like wearing black with navy, I think. Like, it just, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know, and then as I started, like, you know, as, as the idea coalesced more and more, it occurred to me that the themes I was exploring are exactly the same themes that my journalism explores. And I came to also feel a sense of release in writing it because there are ways to tell truths in fiction that is uh, that are that are unavailable to you in journalism i can't really have my subtext rebel against my text when i mm. when i when i write a piece of journalism if that happens it means i've done a very bad job <laughs> if if it happens in my comic then i think i did a pretty good job it's 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 hard to and so accordingly i found myself you know, whenever you, whenever, I think any any journalist and certainly any investigative journalist ha has moments where th there's stuff that they know or they think they know that for one professional reason or other they can't express. Maybe they don't have the the confirmation necessary to to tell a really blockbuster story, and they've got to just sort of keep trying and keep trying and keep trying without being too specific. Once I started writing Waller versus Wildstorm, I found ways to kind of get across things in my things from my journalism that I'm not professionally able to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I just found it like maybe this is just, you know, not saying anything, you know, more interesting than like I'm one person, but I just found more and more that, you know, Waller versus Wildstorm like reads like kind of like an over the top fictionalized version of this stuff that I normally write about and I normally mm -hmm. cover and may seem kind of familiar, but now I get to do things like have characters that I don't agree with, have characters who are heroic but who don't agree with me. I mean, I, I don't mean to say I don't do that in my stories. I do that I right. think, quite a lot, but in, in a way that from the purposes of, of advancing multiple narratives at the same time that add up to hopefully one big thing that you will hopefully see by our final issue, which will be issue four, it was just a measure of storytelling that allowed me access to some of the things I found frustrating in doing journalism, if that makes sense. Mm, definitely. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that Lois Lane figures in this comic. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, because like, I think like that's obvious from it. Like, I think it's so cool to have a journalist writing from the perspective of Lois trying to get a story as a journalist and the frustrations that she experiences in there. I mean, maybe maybe elaborate on some of that after we get into spoilers, but how much how much of the the pitch for telling the story also came from being able to have Lois perspective in the book as a journalist? It was a th like there are definitely, you know, I tried my hardest to like get rid of the fanboy moments, like the indulgent <laughs> moments that come like the first time I certainly speaking for myself, other writers who are probably more professional may have their mileages varied. But from when I got this, I wanted to keep that 
that kind of same enthusiasm. And the thing that I was probably most enthusiastic about was like getting approval to use Lois Lane. I, I really, really, I, you know, from the start of conceiving of this, you know, I tried to be cognizant of my limits as a storyteller working in a mm-hmm. medium I've never worked in and always having, you know, from the perspective of a reader and certainly now as, you know, someone who's written a grand total of one comic book, an abiding respect for the craft. And part of having that respect, I felt, was recognizing that if I was to tell this story successfully, it would make a lot of sense to have this also be a journalism story. And, you know, if if DC Comics characters are, you know, gods and avatars, then Lois Lane is the, you know, greatest DC mythological hero of, of truth and journalism. And I wanted to, I could, you know, we, we can perhaps say more about this in the spoiler section, but it was extremely meaningful to get, to write her, to get, to kind of work out some of my own history journalistically some of things some of the things that i think of as like my flaws my poor tendencies things i want to improve upon through lois and to to definitely do that with a sense that like this is one of the most important characters in in comics <laughs> like lois yeah. lane is 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 an absolutely crucial figure not just i think for for the superman franchise but for for all of dc and you know by extension all of comics there you know there there can't there isn't quite another figure like her and i thought you know given that the mandate of this book was to do an amanda waller year 1 that that would provide a kind of natural opportunity to show a Lois Lane earlier in her career than yeah. we're used to seeing. Yeah. And that's really cool. Let's talk about Waller. What did you remember your first time encountering Amanda Waller's character? And like, what did that signal to you? Like, how did you connect with it way back when? It was a back issue, the issue of Suicide Squad, a comic that at that point I had never read where on the cover is this gorgeous, I'm pretty sure it's John Byrne, drawing of Waller boxing out and like getting into the face of an angry and much larger Batman. Suicide Squad 10. Truly iconic comic book cover above one of the most ever. Yeah. And and beyond, you know, and and this was a cover that truly delivered on on what it depicted. If you've not read this, Amanda Waller, who I, a character I had not previously encountered and who is not depicted as a superhero, defeats Batman in that issue. And I don't think I had ever read a story in, in which Batman lost, and particularly lost <laughs> like that because he's outsmarted. And after that, you know, particularly as I, you know, got more and more into security questions, questions about the security state, its relationship to a, you know, to, to democratic possibilities or its, its, ab- its abrogation of those. She became such a, a more like fascinating character to me. You are totally right. Like her, her depiction in the Justice League animated series is a formative one. She's, She's an amazing and really, I feel like in that one, more straightforwardly villainous, nuanced, textured, but but definitely villain coded. Maybe that's a necessity of, of it being a cartoon. But then going from that to Greg Rucka's classic Checkmate series, which, you know, in addition to the, you know, Ostrander Suicide Squad really defines Amanda for me. The Amanda Waller, who is really just like at the height of her powers, she's running an intelligence agency. She's blackmailing 
UN representatives that are supposed to oversee her. Greg's checkmate and, and his depiction of Amanda, just like in his miniseries with, with Mike Perkins about Lois Lane, the maxi series, I should say, is also an enormous influence on the mm. way I take these characters. And when the assignment for the book was something that could work as an Amanda Waller year one, I wanted to take the character that we see in those moments, you know, defeating Batman, blackmailing the Chinese ambassador to the United Nations, you know, being an enormous, you know, bureaucratic thorn in the side pursuing the Justice League in, you know, the, those classic, you know, Dwayne McDuffie written cartoons. Just wanted to, to take her and put her in a circumstance in which, like, we see what she does when she has power. What does she do when she doesn't quite yield power, when she doesn't quite wield power yet? Mm-hmm. And, and that is the Amanda that, that we're, we're presenting in, in Waller versus Wildstorm. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. And I, I, one of the things I love about this book is you guys, and this has been true, I think, for most of the people who've written the character significantly, at least, you've avoided the girl bossification of Amanda Waller which is really important because if she's just like a standard girl boss, that's just too easy. It's, it's too cheap and it's like, doesn't have the nuance necessary for her to be the interesting, powerful person, you know, that has been so fascinating for so many decades. Well, thank you so much for that. That, that really means that I did my job. I wanted I wanted this to be, especially when you do a year one, certainly I'll say, you know, I I say this like I've done this more than once and maybe I should check (laughs) myself immediately. But like my approach, maybe this is a better way into it. My approach to, to doing a year one story was to make sure that Amanda Waller is familiar to, to a reader who's, you know, followed her exploits for the past, I suppose, 35 years but also is creating an argument for new readers for why they should care about this character, why they should pay attention to this character, why they should follow this character if this happens to be somehow anyone's first Amanda Waller comic back to her, her you know, normal DC Universe exploits. And so she needed to, to not be, to the best of my ability, she needed to not be a character who would feel sort of tropey. I, you know, I have a lot of feelings. I have a lot of observations about intelligence agencies from reporting (laughs) over, (laughs) over the years. And that certainly that girl bossy route has certainly been quite present. And I did not see in Amanda's character history someone who would adopt that approach except when it is ruthlessly expedient. And, and so I tried to kind of take that into the character. And I, and I think certainly in, in the first issue, I'm not saying you're going to see really her, her be a girl boss in this book at all. I mean to say that you know, Amanda in my head as I'm answering your question stops me from speaking categorically because if there is a true North for Amanda Waller, she'll do what she absolutely needs to do in in, in the moment. And I certainly yeah. write that throughout the series. Well, you let her be manipulative and focused on power in the ways that are necessary for her character and like not be woobified. You know, and I can see it being easy for people to say like, well, we want to see this like young black woman do the right thing. And, you know, it's like, yeah, we do. But this isn't the one. (laughs) This is, but this, she's not that character. There's other people for that. If, you you know, and if I did my job right, you will see that sort of impulse and the structural dynamics underlying it 
without spoiling anything, mm-hmm. appear again and again and again throughout the series. Yeah. Um, the fact that Amanda Waller is a black woman rising to power inside an intelligence structure that to be extremely mild about it is not particularly interested in treating black people very well and is often interested in persecuting black people Mm -hmm. makes that, you know, very necessary to address in this story, but it needs to be addressed on Amanda Waller's terms. And, And that's what I think we, we endeavored to present in this first issue and then throughout this series. And it's also like you're looking at her and you're saying, well, we, we, we want to see how she's able to become successful in this space while recognizing that she's up against sexism, she's up against sizeism, she's up against racism, but also she's in an institution that is categorically evil. And that's like a hard thing to sit for a lot of people to sit with. I wanted very much to bring out a question about how it is that someone like Amanda could be in these pos- in the positions that we've seen her in throughout the DC universe to make an argument about it to address how historically anomalous someone like her is in such positions how perhaps she might view that how perhaps she might react to these structural pressures and obstacles that she encounters. And there will be moments in this series where that is moments in, I, you know, if I've done my job right in every issue of the, of this series where that is addressed from a different angle. Another, another big piece of this is that you are the guy who got to put Deathstroke and Grifter in the same panel. (laughs) No, Hold on one sec. That that that's not a spoiler, right? Like that's on, that's on the cover, right? So no, we definitely have a cover in which both Deathstroke and Grifter are are on there. So it's it, it okay. can't be a spoiler. You okay. have spoiled nothing. So you have gotten to marry the Wildstorm universe, which has always been, or at least big chunks of it, has always been really preoccupied with international politics, espionage, and security state as a construct with the part of the DC universe that is interested in those questions as well. Specifically, the Checkmate, Suicide Squad, Task Force Exe, Amanda Waller, you know, side of the DC universe. And you got like so much of the work of this you know, I mean, nobody wants to re- nobody wants to read comics about continuity, but it is really cool to see how well you are able to interweave these two worlds that have historically existed separately into one thing that makes sense. Right. And it's crazy ambitious. Well, like, thank you I get so much. the cool. I mean, that's one of the cool things about being black label. I guess is that you get to just jump and do that, and you don't have to like cross check with what's okay. I guess, but like. You've brought these things together in here. Well, thank you so much. And and really a tremendous amount of credit I want to extend to my amazing editors, Chris Conroy and Marquise Draper, for letting me do this at all. And, mm. you know, when we started conceptualizing what the story was, along with my co-writer Evan Narciss, it was like I I I one of the first things I asked is like, can I grab Wildstorm characters? Because this is DC Black Label and it's out of continuity. And they let me do that. And I was extremely, extremely grateful for that. Because from the start, I wanted to see like Amanda Waller interact in, in, in a kind of world in which it's the DCU, but it's with the, a kind of hybrid of the Wildstorm institutions with the DCU spy side institutions, but definitely with the feel of, of a, of a wild storm comic and with the kind of tone and preoccupations of a wild storm comic, which, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in addition to, as you say, you know, is very much, you know, a security state focused universe. It also has had this attitude of, you know, with, you know, going back to like the halo corporation of skepticism toward capitalism, you know, a willingness to, to view 
corporate interests as similarly untrustworthy to intelligence agency and government interests. And that had to be in this book for sure. We we can talk about that much more in the spoilers. Yes. Section, but I want, you know, from the start, I just saw this as, as, you know, a wild storm book in which like I could also get to see who from the Wildstorm universe and from the DCU main mainline, you know, Earth One universe work well together. And, you know, naturally that's going to be I'm just at this point in the in the the podcast just going to talk about characters who are, you know, clearly on the cover, but like yeah. <laughs> Grifter, Deathstroke, we get to put in there the amazing Jorge Fornes cover also shows Winter from Stormwatch and our other main protagonist of the book, one of, I think, my, just a character who I you know, wanted to write, you know, ever since I saw his portrayal in the Ellis Rainey Stormwatch, Jackson King Battalion, mm. the leader of Stormwatch, another really fantastic character who is also anomalous within an intelligence agency's, you know, high ranks by virtue of being a black man, but perhaps with a much different perspective than Amanda Waller's. Yeah. No, they're really interesting to see the two of them operate in the same comic together. Like, what an amazing idea. <laughs> and and for listeners, if you, you are not like a big Wildstorm person, I am not either. And I got by fun. Like, Phew. I... You know, like I'm a hardcore fan of the authority, the, but I, I've only read Drips and Drabs of Stormwatch. I've never read Wildcats. I don't think you need that information to enjoy this. But whenever I, after I read it and I Googled a couple of, you know, names, it, and then I went back and I read some stuff I hadn't read before and it enriched my enjoyment a lot, but it is not necessary. So like, if you're like, oh, I don't read Wildstorm, that's okay. You can read this anyway, folks. Well, thank you for that, because that's also extremely validating slash relieving. The assignment had to be, because it's called Waller versus Wildstorm, you know, completely accessible to people who who have not read either a Wildstorm comic or you know, outside of, you know, seeing her in an ensemble book and Amanda Waller's story, totally accessible. It helps that because of Black Label, um, continuity is not a factor here. We're not doing strict continuity. We are doing vibes. But also, you know, there has to be stuff in here for for the heads, for the diehards. Yes, for for, You know, stuff that... If you are fans of Wildstorm going back 30 years, Wildstorm going back 20 years, Wildstorm going back 15 years, there's stuff for you in here throughout throughout the series. So hopefully I struck that balance. Mm-hmm. It's certainly something I recognize that my first time out probably is not, you know, going to be, you know, perfect form, but I tried hard. Well, you know, we'll talk about it in the spoilers section, which we'll probably just do very soon. But like, there's a couple of things where I felt like, oh, now it makes more sense than it did before. Mm, you know, <laughs> so so that's always exciting. I wanted to um, honor this stuff, but not be beholden to it. Yeah, yeah. Wildstorm is very rooted in the '90s, and it feels like part of this project is taking Wildstorm, placing it in the history of the 80s, but making it work with today's understanding of global politics and the kinds of comics that we read now. You mentioned earlier, and I think really skillfully, you know, why you were excited to have this take place before your, the period of time in which you were journalisming, so to speak. But are, are there other things that you kept in mind in terms of this being a period piece, both in terms of what you're pulling from in the yeah. comics style and era, as well as with the history that we talked about? So when, when the assignment came to do this as a year one, I realized that could be a kind of storytelling opportunity because it could help me convey themes with the benefit of knowing that, you know, we know from the vantage point of 2023, how certain geopolitical gambles work out or don't work out. And also geoeconomic gambles work out or don't work out. And that made me want to set 
the book at the it's sort of an indeterminate period at the end of the Cold War, because that also seemed like a good way of 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 getting to, you know, the threshold of the 90s wildstorm, but also the the kind of time period, roughly speaking, in a you know, in a sliding time scale of a kind of feel for the original Ostrander suicide yeah. squad. So you could you can kind of do multiple storytelling duties at once through that device that we take place at the the tail end of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War from this book is visible, but we don't have to be too super specific about that. And that's a period in which America is on the verge of obtaining sole superpower status, bestriding the globe with no competitor and no subsequent restraint. It would really be interesting, I think, as someone who has reported on the wages of that from the 9-11 era, Mm. of looking at setting a story at a point in which people with enormous geopolitical ambitions would face the fewest constraints that they would have ever faced. Hmm. What would they do in that circumstance? And how would that work in a superhero universe? Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. What has always been so appealing to you about the Suicide Squad checkmate, like corner, espionage corner of the DC universe? It's one of the best ideas in comics, fight me. Suicide Squad is a brilliant idea. It's something that, you know, an idea is great when... As soon as someone pulls it off, you immediately think, how could that, you know, not have, yeah. how, how could this not have always existed? Right, right. You know, the idea that you would be looking at how the carceral state seeks to manipulate and dispose of its its rogues, its dregs, its captives, and put it to deniable use by intelligence agencies, it would be malpractice of me for what I cover if I wasn't interested in that, right? Like it would, it, I, I can't not want but Even it. as a kid though, right? Like that was, even as a kid, right? Well, I did come to Suicide Squad later than, than I came mm. to a whole lot of other comics, which is probably oh, okay. you know, appropriate. But, you know, definitely, True. yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> like, you know, from the moment I started like going back from that, from the issue in which Amanda defeats Batman, being like, what is happening here? And then seeing in the first issue of the Suicide Squad, we're like, they're going to a loosely veiled Iraq? Like, just thinking like, oh my God. Like, th- you know, th- this is yeah. this is doing something that, you know, you don't really see comics very often, even within making up a fake a fake country and i certainly you know go with a fake country in this book nevertheless in in doing that disguise in in kind of not literalizing it you get to convey greater truths about Mm -hmm. what yeah you know moving back from any specific case what u.s foreign policy is and definitely not to compare myself to him orhan pamuk's recent pandemic novel knights of plague which is a, 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 an enormous social novel that takes place within the final generation of the Ottoman Empire, invents an island called Mingaria rather than having it be Cyprus or something or, or any number of you know, multi-ethnic and multi-confessional um, holdings in the Ottoman Empire, and accordingly is freer to tell yeah. a, a much more ambitious and I think truthful story about that final generation of the Ottoman Empire. And that's a weird place for me to reach, but I read this novel recently and I I, I Mm -hmm. absolutely adored it. I'm definitely not comparing myself to Orhan Pamuk. I'm really, really not. <laughs> no, I yeah, no, but I, I I get it. I mean, like, is that always one of the big debates between us po- between us very politically minded folks who read DC and read Marvel? I mean, there's a lot of back and forth over what is more effective? You know, the DC DC doesn't even exclusively use fake countries, but the DC tendency towards fake countries, fake city names, versus the Marvel tendency towards the real names, and like what enables a better, more political storytelling, really. 
And also, I should say, I might not be Orhan Pamuk, but Evan might be. Anyway, mm. if you're I not reading that. Evan's also, if you're not reading the, the other incredible stuff that, that Evan is doing right now, including, you know, with the Bath family in, in Gotham Knights, it's, it's really, you know, tremendous. And you got to check it out to say nothing. I'm so glad I got to have him on the show this past summer. He was a really great guest. And we I- did talk about wrestling a lot. But <laughs> I, you yeah. know, I, I am so thrilled that I got to work with him. He was a friend of mine before this, and he was someone who I was kind of nervously bouncing my my pitch for this book off of. Anyway, you know, it it just made sense, you know, to again re- in recognizing my limits and in trying to tell the best, trying to do, and this is something that we also you know struggle with sometimes in journalism. But trying to pull off the best story you can pull off and do the best, you know, job by the reader will sometimes involve like bringing in someone who, like Evan, has written comics at a very high level. Rise of the Black Panther is, I think, one of the best miniseries of the past decade. It's really good. But beyond, but then I, I, I answered that instead of your, your question. So what did Remind me what you asked. Oh, I was asking about like the debate we have between the virtues of having things being in the real countries, real places versus the invented ones of the DC tends towards. I mean, there's there's definitely arguments for both. I love in the Marvel universe the fact that like I get to see, you know, versions of, you know, New York City where I was born and raised and, and currently live. Would, you know, necessarily this story work in a real country that the United States has destabilized? Probably not. Mm. Um, We could talk more about this in in spoilers, but I wanted to use the setting of this book as a way of both like alighting too much particularism about U.S. foreign policy, both in the Cold War and then in the War on Terror, but also in, in alighting it not align it at all and kind of address, you know, as much of it as as works within the framework of the story. You can't really do it if like the book takes place in, you know, El Salvador, or if the book takes place in Vietnam, or, you know, on and on and on. And you have, I think, an additional obligation to represent people's real stories in a certain way when it takes place in a real place that like, we're American and maybe we're not the best equipped to do some of those things. Definitely. And what I try and do in the book throughout what a theme of the book is, and I don't think this is a spoiler is that these other perspectives are rarely respected uh, by the prerogatives of the American security apparatus. You don't say. You don't say, right. I'm saying something, you know, super controversial there. Well, with that, let's get into full-on spoilers, guys. If you have not yet bought yourself a copy of this comic, go request that from your local comic book store. You know, if if you're not able to do that, buy it online. And we will be here for you to listen to the rest of our conversation as soon as we return right now. Okay. I'm still excited. Yeah. Talk to me about the invention of General Rong, R-O-N-G, which I didn't even think about significance of her name until I was writing this question down. I'm like, oh, her name is Rong, but she speaks truth. And a big theme of the book comes on page two when she says, America is just the clothes capital wears. And Lois, you know, tries to dig around that question, not necessarily push back, but like, journalistically dig around what does she mean by that and she asks what so a banker is going to kill the people her dictator father wouldn't and then we get that wonderful held head tilt and eyebrow raise from jesus also that just really, all that was yeah. all jesus that like he, the yeah. the work he put in not just on you know that page but on all of these pages i think like if, if, like me, you are a fan of Jesus Marino and you've seen him do incredible superhero work, Superman, the Justice League, like the most, you know, iconic DC characters there are, I think you will be blown away by the level he is unlocked and is operating on in this story. I gave him hard stuff to draw. Because Mm -hmm. I did, especially on this script, because I didn't know what I was doing. Like, this was my first 
comic book script. And he gets the subtle, like he expresses this with a subtlety that my writing at times does not, does, does not achieve. And I, I am standing on his shoulders and, and, and am so incredibly grateful for him. But yes, I wanted there to be a kind of Commandante Ramona style from the Easy LN, the Zapatistas, to kind mm. of start out the book and show in this, this all, you know, came a bit through something of a continuity dive to explain what's going on here. Although if you've read it, to, I guess, I guess if you're, if you're listening, you've decided you either don't care about spoilers or you've read the book. Yeah. So let me, so I'll just say, you know, the book, you, I set the book in Gamora, which is one of the main recurrent like villain locations of the Wildstorm universe. If you're an X-Men person, the closest, you know, and the closest analog is Madripoor. It's not really that, but it's it's kind of vibes. And canon in in the Wildstorm universe is that like one of the recurrent villains, Kaizen Gamora, who we talk about a lot on the first two pages of the book and then kind of throughout the issue occasionally, is this like maniacal, you know, domineering supervillain who has conquered this this Pacific island that's kind of Indonesia, kind of Singapore, kind of, you know, like yeah. on that, that kind that of That was religion. the vibe I had. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Not um, having ever been there, but yes. <laughs> but like he renamed this for himself. There was always something called Perugia that came before the Gamora era, before Kaizen Gamora gets a hold of it. And I just, you know, thought, I, I and I, I wanted to show like, there must have been some kind of, you know, domestic internal resistance move to Kaizen Gamora, people who remember and will fight to the end to free Perugia, to restore it to what it was. People who are willing to devote their lives in solidarity with one another to make sure that Perugia does not disappear from the face of the earth. And there is also in the Wildstorm universe, another character Yumiko Gamora, Kaizen's daughter, who is a character called Cybernary. I, I Googled her after I read this issue, and I just, I mean, this is a good example where I just really think you're going to be doing an amazing job synthesizing some canon into something that, like, really makes a ton of sense in a fun way. And so, like, I wanted to kind of, like, you know, it it's, you know, Canonically, the Yumiko Kaizen relationship is is quite fraught, but I wanted to kind of use, you know, the legacy of Kaizen bequeathing Gamora to Yumiko to kind of show a kind of turn of the historical ratchet from Cold War anti communism into neoliberalism, and I thought like introducing Yumiko as the kind of next ruler of Gamora outpacing Kaizen, who we, you know, we've seen a lot throughout, you know, the Wildstorm universe. We've comparatively seen much less Yumiko um, mm. would, would, would allow a way in to the story that General Rong on those first two pages exposits why she thinks that Kaizen is an abomination and needed to have been opposed all of this time. But Yumiko represents a very urgent danger that could actually permanently wipe out their way of life. I think it's also Kaizen is such a broad character based in a lot of Orientalist tropes that they then, sub I mean, which the comics also subvert, like they're not just taking it on you know, at, the same, at, at, at the same time, there's, there's some stuff there that I, yes. you know, th that a reader need not be subjected to. Shall we say. Yes, this is right. Exactly. Nevertheless, even, even if you take him as being like a postmodern version of this, he's still a very broad villain that doesn't really match with most despots as they function in the real world. And I see what you're doing with his daughter being like, oh, this is that motherfucker who went to this fancy boarding school with like some people who I know from real life who, you know, like 
then goes off and does grad school in Yale. And then next thing you know, they're like being terrifying running a country somewhere that is, you know, that it's a US client state. And, you know, she's an international banker. We say she's a favorite of the of the Davos crowd, all of that. We, you know, I wanted Yumiko Gamora to, you know, I mentioned earlier trying to write this book so that like the reader's knowledge several decades on of what, you know, this world is like. Yumiko Gamora is a pretty familiar character, I think, in in, in 2023. You know, not her character literally, but the sort of leader that she is, the interests that she exposits the base of support that she has, the perspective. And, you know, we see this clearly Mm -hmm. filtered through, you know, Rong's, you know, relentless opposition to this. Later in this miniseries, we will see Yumiko speak for herself. But that was very, that, that, that I thought was, was something that you just could get a lot of storytelling mileage out of. And I'll also say, like, there's plenty of people in the real world who believe the hype about those people. Yes, there's people who are, like, paid collaborators with the Yumikos of the world. But there's also a lot of people who just, like, believe this bullshit they're sold about how these business school grads are going to rescue, quote unquote, these developing countries. Yes, in in the moral universe that the real life analogs of these characters inhabit the Yumikos are the heroes and the wrongs are the, just to, you know, use a word at random terrorists Mm -hmm. that, you know, we start out hearing this from the perspective of the person to whom a, this is happening B for whom the stakes are the highest and C most likely to be vilified in media portrayals. And that's also why I I needed to start this with Lois Lane interviewing her. Yeah. And what an interview it is. Was this inspired by perhaps some experiences of you or your colleagues that you can think on or? Yes, definitely. So I didn't want to be, I worried that there would be, there were self-indulgent moments that I cut out of earlier drafts. Some things in this book happened to me more literally than others. And we can we can get into those if you like, but A, you know, she's mostly I'll just put it like this. I've had to interview over the course of my career some very bad people. Some <laughs> of those very bad people fight for the United States, some of them fight against the United States. One of them, one of whom, one of, one of them that I'm always going to remember is an American from Arkansas, not much younger than I am, who fled to Somalia to join Al-Shabaab, the, which would, at, at the time it wasn't, now it is, the East African uh, Al-Qaeda affiliate. His name, is, his name was Omar Hamami. And I don't think for a second, that Omar is general wrong. But in order to write Lois in that scene, I had to kind of give her the kind of energy of not knowing totally like how far like she can go in interviewing someone like wrong in Mm. order to write that. Omar Hamami, soon after I... You know, and and it's just it was just a very strange experience talking with someone who, like, you know, doesn't particularly have the most enlightened views about the Jewish people, shall we say. <laughs> Nevertheless, like the job is, you know, not necessarily to sympathize with such people, but to understand them on their yeah. terms and be able to explicate them to an audience that is very interested in them, whether perhaps they know it or not, whether perhaps they want to hear his perspective or not. And that was something that I brought again, you know, wrong is definitely not Omar. Omar Hamami, like at one point was corresponding with me 
while he got while he got killed by, by a jihadist faction that he had turned against. Yeah, it's not a life I recommend people go and live. Anyway, I don't know if you want to get to this later, but like Lois's experience at the mm-hmm. end of the comic is very much a panic attack that I have had. Yeah. So yeah, there's that felt very real. There's like yeah. I, you know, I, I I wanted to put like real stuff, including like real pressures. There's there's a bit with her editor that, believe me, was earlier versions were much more self-indulgent than that. But like I wanted to have her fight with her editor about the importance of of the interview that we see because I that's mean, a, because fucking, that's a real thing know. in new in newsrooms. Oh my god! No, this fucking editor, like, it's so your perspective of this is you're a journalist. My perspective of this is as someone who's been a communications staffer for left wing American organizations, including labor unions, including community based organizations. This is for for the for the listeners. This is how we know each other. Oh yeah, this is how I know each other. Like for um, fifteen years. Yeah. <laughs> Although I've never pitched you on anything. No, no, no. We, like, we don't really. I don't really cover yeah. this stuff. Yeah, anyway, it's very different lights. But um, but yeah, we are kind of from the same world in that way. But we we have both dealt with that editor on different places. For me, when I hear what I hear when things get passed down to me with like the editor doesn't want me to run this, I hear Capital has decided that we yeah. only want to hear from the boss and. Even though we know readers would be more interested in your story because your story is actually interesting and real, we are refusing to put it on because we are owned by corporate power. So I guess we won't actually take your quote from your community-based organization and or labor union and we'll pretend you don't exist. When you hear guys like that editor in your comic and you're coming at this as a reporter versus as a, a comms staffer, like, are you also hearing them say that as because we are in the pockets of capital or like, because how does this not sell a million papers? This sounds like a thing that sells a million papers. Well, I gave, so I was, you know, very pleased. I was thinking, you know, who at the Daily Planet could this character be? Like, it can't really be mm. Perry because, you know, we, lo- <laughs> we like Perry. We White. love Perry. Perry. Exactly. Yeah. Like Perry, you know, Perry's been that guy. It, it can't be Jimmy because Jimmy is subordinate to Lois. And it definitely can't be Superman. <laughs> and like, it, it, you know, Cat Grant isn't ever like Lois's editor. I don't think maybe, maybe that's actually wrong, but, but yeah, there yeah. is this like lunkhead jerk at the Daily Planet canonically, Steve Lombard, who's usually on the sports desk, but I got to kind of perhaps write, you know, what happened is, you know, what, what was up with Steve Lombard earlier in his career? <laughs> he was doing this and like, I got to give him the line. You know, this is the Daily Planet, Lois. We don't print propaganda because I yeah. that has been usually not said in those words to me by editors. But, you know, in terms of what you hear as a communications person coming from the perspective that you've come, I have often heard that message in, in trying to present aspects of a story from a perspective that is that that isn't American and speaks to what people have endured because of America. And I, I definitely wanted, because I also like, as a journalist throughout like my 20 odd years of doing this, I don't really do a lot of media criticism for, for reasons that, you know, will probably, you know, bore your audience. Hmm. But here I felt I could get to do that. Here I felt like through, you know, fictionalizing the experience, you could kind of give a reader a bit of a peek into like how the news that they get at the end of the process comes to be. And often, particularly on important stories, you know, and thankfully not exclusively, you know, there is a clash. There's not always a clash. I've been very lucky, lucky, to work with editors who have both supported my journalism have come from, you know, if not, you know, if not necessarily, you know, similar perspectives, similar senses of mission that Mm -hmm. journalism has to, you know, hear from these perspectives. But then I've also worked with editors like Steve Lombard. Totally, totally. No, that felt cathartic. (laughs) But I'm always just like, do they understand? Do they know they're the bad? Do they know that they're the bad guy in the TV movie? Like, I don't understand. I'll say this. Mm-hmm. uniformly they think of themselves 
as upholding the standards of the publication that they are holding to the editorial mission and that part of their job is to make sure that journalists who seek to write for that publication do so in a style, loosely speaking, that comports with, you know, editorial standards. They view that as value neutral and as a matter of craft. I respect that. I, I have similar, you know, devotions to craft and to standards. But I think, you know, we in the media often launder values knowledgeably or, you know, subconsciously through approaches like that. And that we would come to see, you know, perhaps if we looked at it from a broader perspective of how, you know, other countries, other eras perform journalism, that inevitably that approach is value-laden and is not in fact value neutral. You know, there's a line, I'll, I'll use, you know, the. do you watch Succession? No. Oh, well, ugh. Succession, as you're probably aware, is, you know, I'm sure a fair amount of listeners will be aware, Go is about it. like a right-wing media dynasty, you know, loosely, you know, the Murdochs. And at one point, the editor-in-chief of the Waystar Royco, they call it ACN, I think, they, whatever, the, you know, definitely not Fox News of succession, the editor-in-chief is challenged on, you know, how, you know, deeply distorted their editorial, you know, focus is. And the editor-in-chief of definitely not Fox News responds, you know, the people who work <laughs> here are people who, you know, are signed on with the mission. And I think that is an underappreciated perspective in journalism. There are always some people at a news organization who are there. It's always a, it's always a, it's always a, a mixture. It's people who need jobs. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. people who are trying hard to stay in mainstream journalism in, or, you know, or even on, you know, slightly outside the mainstream journalism as the media landscape fractures and the, you know, funding models become less and less stable as has happened consistently throughout the 20 years in which I was smart enough to choose this as a career. <laughs> then it's, you know, a lot of people who happen to align with the mission of the organization, see it as valorous. And then others who also don't always have to work to survive, who take those missions and I did at, at those news organizations and identify with them so thoroughly that it yeah. can be a little bit of a minefield sometimes to push against that. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. I appreciate it. Certainly some catharsis for me. Another really great moment in this comic was you have, when you have this amazing face to face table at the table meeting between battalion and Waller battalion says to her of Nigel it was a, it was a storm march character who yeah, sort of gets off hell strike who gets off in sort of the premise of the story. Yeah. Very sorry to the, the hell strike fans out there. I now know who he is. Cause I read one of the issues he was in. So he, battalion says he was the best of checkmate, the real checkmate. When we did civil rights enforcements before this shit, and with that like wonderful emphasis on the word this shit, and okay. I, I, I really enjoyed it, but because it's also there's a sort of wink that's like, and and Lois and him talk about it too. Like, who, how are you? Who do you, who decides who's the good the good guy? security state organization and the bad guy security state organization and you know the agency's fighting over like who's letting checkmate operate abroad they're not supposed to do that the idea with check, did, like you know in your world did checkmate ever do real civil rights enforcements i mean i know you know in the first issue of checkmate we see them not first issue but yeah first arc of the original checkmate series they're going against white nationalists 
This is the founding like, premise yeah. of the original yeah. 1980s Checkmate series by Paul Kupperberg and Steve Irwin. And when it, you know, it's very different from what it will be by the time, say, you know, Greg Rucker writes it in the in the 2000s. And that struck me as an enormous storytelling opportunity that Checkmate canonically was in the comic book sense, you know, a weird superhero agency premised on on promoting civil rights. Weirdly, Harvey Bullock is there. <laughs> like, I know. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's 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 a wild ride, but I recommend checking out those those books. But yeah. the storytelling potential is in how neatly it encapsulates the way American Cold War anti-communism and ultimately the broader ideology of liberal internationalism uses pretexts like, you know, enforcing, you know, standing up for human rights and so forth as a, you know, on a, on a pretextual basis in order to accomplish the, you know, economic and geostrategic interests of the American empire. I'm, I mean, I, yeah. I'm mostly through an incredible book published last year called Legacy of Violence by the Harvard scholar Caroline Elkins, which is a history of the British Empire. It is just really vivid to see the ways in which, you know, it's always at bottom a mission civil histories, right? It's always predicated on the interests of, you know, promoting development amongst conquered populations. It's always supposedly in their interest. You know, Women's rights were a rationale for, you know, the British con conquest and, you know, deep economic exploitation of the Indian subcontinent. Yeah. Th this is this has been there even, you know, before America specifically did it beyond the, you know, beyond the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. It is something that, again, allows you know, is, is one of those ha is, is one of those like happy moments of discovery when you realize that there is something that, you know, because it's an out of continuity book and I'm mashing up a bunch of stuff and synthesizing a bunch of stuff, the elements that I'm synthesizing should feel recognizably familiar for the people who have read this stuff before. And like getting to see that we are at you know, issue one is really all about this, right? From wrong speech, you know, forward, that we are at a turn of the historical ratchet. And much like wrong is trying to restore the homeland of Perugia and free her people, so to Battalion, a long time checkmate operative, and I know I'm situating Stormwatch within checkmate for this series, but nevertheless, He's someone who believes in that original mandate of mm -hmm. the Kupperberg Irwin checkmate run. And I thought there was a lot of power in bringing that out and showing that perhaps this is not what checkmate ultimately stays. Do you think that it's ever possible for it to be that, though? I mean, history has shown it hasn't been, but do you think it's impossible? Yes. The short answer is yes. Imperialism is not for the benefit of of the rights and dignity of the people that it ravages and exploits. Yeah, but there's people who don't believe it is imperialism. Like they genuinely don't believe it. Yes, they're wrong. Yeah. But they genuinely. This is the fight I have with my dad all the time. So, I wanted to make sure that someone who, on a variety of points across you know the spectrum. Of, of political debate and, and opinion about this stuff are represented here and not to be laughed at. It's a bad and hackish comic if every character, you know, who's, you know, hero coded is articulating my perspective on shit. Mm. And it's a bad book and a hackish book if every villain coded character is articulating a perspective I think is wrong. I thought yeah. it was <laughs> crucial to have a character like Battalion challenge a character like Amanda 
and challenge a character like Lois and have a character like Lois challenge a character like Battalion. And we're going to keep seeing this kind of like tripartite dynamic of perspective shifts, you know, interact with one another, influence one another at all times. I want all of them to have an articulable, clear point. Often I want, them to be making good points, strong points, not necessarily points that I agree with, but articulating their perspective at their strongest, not at their weakest. And like, is Steve Lombard really wrong when he says that Lois's piece simply articulates whatever it is that wrong told her? Probably not because that was who Lois interviewed. You know what I'm saying? Like even Lombard, who I think, you know, is clearly in here to to kind of, you know, both show readers how journalism is made, but also, yeah, to to express a certain kind of, 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 of catharsis, you know, on my part, he still has to make good points. He still has to not just be, you know, a total buffoon. And, you know, if you've read my book, Reign of Terror, that kind of tripartite approach is something that I, I I kind of do a lot. Like I give a right wing perspective, I present a liberal perspective, and I present a security state perspective. Later on in the book, I bring in you know socialist and left wing perspectives to to kind of challenge that out. But because like the main characters, you know, in terms of like broad currents of the war on terror, are right wingers, liberals, and security state personnel, the book had to kind of be like dealing with those three perspectives in how they relate to one another, how they sometimes challenge one another, how they sometimes align with one another, how they all clash with one another and so on. And that's the approach I took to Waller versus Wildstorm, where you're going to see perspectives that I think are right and I think are wrong, be both wrong and right in Mm -hmm. various positions. I, I really wanted it to, you know, if I do my if if I did my job well, and if I did my job well, it is also because I had the enormous help of an incredible, incredible creative team. Once again, Evan, Jesus, Michael, Chris, and Marquise. But also, if I did the job well, it's because you know readers will come away from this asking questions about who they think is right and wrong in each of these perspectives in this in the specific scene and then overall and i want to have it be something of a destabilizing experience not something where this is a book where it's just heroes versus villains because the world that i write about and the world that i think we inhabit is just much messier than that and also because that's the, that's wildstorm Wildstorm right. history is so often, it's also, you know, Amanda Waller's history, but it's also like Wildstorm's history is very much like you will find in Wildstorm comics, like straight hero versus straight villain fights. But what you most often find are heroes and villains aligned with various institutions against one another, against heroes and villains. And yeah. the relationships that they have are more transactional than a kind of traditional superhero universe and that's one of the reasons i like it so much yeah totally totally well speaking of messy one of a character that we have both share great affection for makes a special appearance in here as well tighten up the defense podcast hub who you, you guys were both on, we were on your show yet. episode yes to talk about deathstroke Tighten up the defense calls adeline kane the most extremely divorced woman in comics <laughs> Now your your series because she is so much more divorced than most divorced women, and also just really is that like eighties divorcee and like how she's presented as like an archetype in the comic. But you have her in here before she became the most extremely divorced woman in DC Comics. You have her when she's still partnering with, as you said in your newsletter, you said Deathstroke, who the mercenaries lobby insists I call the private security contractor. Yes, um, that is a real get- experience of mine. Oh, I'm sure. I am so excited that you get to write this this messy queen who loves drama <laughs> <laughs> and her evil, evil, definitely the worst dad in DC Comics, Deathstroke. 
at an at earlier phase in, in their story together because they are endlessly fascinating. And you pointed something out to me fascinating about Adeline that I did not realize. Yes. So this is definitely before Adeline is the most divorced woman in DC Comics. But is it like, and it's like she's always this person, and I mm-hmm. wanted to make sure she is, but like you <laughs> may notice that Deathstroke has two eyes. Yes. Like in this book. That is because Adeline has not shot out Slade's eye yet <laughs> to end their marriage, you know, in yes. like what if, you know, that is Adeline Kane's version of a breakup. And, you know, after Deathstroke gets their child's throat cut. Um, yeah. I want, I love, love, love both of these characters and wanted very much to show the Adeline Kane that's implied in the classic Titans storyline, the Judas contract. Because if you read the Judas contract, and let's just talk about this for a second, because I, I love mm-hmm. this story too. And I, I'm pretty sure you do also. Oh, thanks uh, to you. You're the one who got me to read it. And perfect. yes, I do. Go ahead. Adeline is introduced as like an exposition engine for like letting Dick Grayson understand like why this guy Deathstroke who has stuck around since the very beginning of this series is like so dangerous and so relentless. And in the process, while the book and subsequent stories don't necessarily dwell on this so much, Adeline creates Deathstroke. She is in, I believe it's, I believe she's, I mean, she's certainly drawn this uniform. She's army special forces, which is an incredible thing for a woman at this point in time to be in certainly no like combat arm specialty would have been open to her. So presumably she's military intelligence, which would work for the story. Yeah. Like in the story, she basically like initiates something of a super soldier experiment on a soldier under her command, which is Slade Wilson, uses him as a guinea pig, enhances him, then has an entirely like court martialable affair mm-hmm. with him that leads to them getting married. Again, this is a subordinate like in within her command. Ad- Adeline is 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 quite is quite a figure. And then like later on in the story, when agents of the real life Carlos the Jackal perform a home invasion to kidnap Joey, Adeline is shown like reaching for that AK and like letting let, letting letting it fly. Like she knows what she's doing in this circumstance. And I wanted so badly in constructing this to be like, let's show how Adeline Kane operated at high levels inside an intelligence agency. And we have Jackson, like, explain that, like, this is kind of what Adeline thinks, like, Checkmate should be. And so we're, we're setting her up as this, like, important big bad to give like this character really i think her due place that's always kind of been there in the DCU and just kind of like bringing it out and making it more explicit and also like from everything we know about how fucked up and evil deathstroke certainly can be and you know with apologies to the Christopher Priest you know series that i absolutely love that is just one of the best superhero comics of, of the last, geez, decades. <laughs> you know, I'm not writing that Deathstroke. I'm writing the early career, the, or certainly earlier career Deathstroke. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what kind of person looks at Slade Wilson <laughs> like, damn, that is my soulmate. Yeah. I want that should be the father of my children. That should, this is yeah, exactly. Idea. Like this is the person I should have a family with. Adeline makes her choices and I want to bring out what those choices are and to bring out like the way that Battalion to his soul is offended by this kind of ruthlessness, by this kind of focus, this, this, this pure exploitation of, of people who might have metahuman abilities for the for to you know be put to use in US foreign policy and also the opportunities 
that that would you know present when you have this civil rights mandated agency that is legally authorized. I I kind of put this in the story for narrative effect. The only at this point in history government agency legally authorized to use metahuman abilities because it supposedly has, you know, this, you know, laudatory civil rights focus. Mm -hmm. But there sure is an Adeline Kane high up in that agency. And what might that mean? And, you know, something you'd pointed out to me was like, despite the fact that like to us, she has this big stature because Boyd, when she shows up, does she have like a great amount of presence? She does not have that many pages with her on page in the comics overall. Not in issue one is all I'll say. Oh, no, I don't mean you. I'm sorry. Oh, you, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. You mean throughout like her character history? Yes. Yeah. It's It was Priest does good stuff with her, but it is kind of mm-hmm. few and far between. And so like I just viewed that as, you know, a way I could kind of run with this character. And again, yeah. I'm not. I don't see myself as inventing stuff with, with Adeline. It's everything that I use as a touchstone for her is on, is on page and has been published for 30 years already. It's in the Judas contract. It's, you know, certainly like between the, the raindrops of the fact that like, Mm -hmm. you know, she's horny for death stroke. (laughs) Yeah. But it's interesting just cause like there's so much there, but there hasn't been as much done with her. And now we can kind of expand on that some more. It's really cool. I, I, you know, yeah. Big challenge not to spoil the rest of the issue, so I won't. But I, I do dwell on Adeline for a while. And I don't think it will be a spoiler to say because, you know, Battalion kind of has his perspective on what the Amanda Adeline relationship is. And that is not, as I hope is, you know, something that I needed to use as a narrative engine for the first issue, not necessarily the perspective he shares with Lois. And that's a choice we can talk about if you want. But later on, as the series progresses, we will see other perspectives on that relationship, including from the two women themselves. Neato. I'm so excited for that. That's really cool. I'm trying so hard not to spoil the rest of this mini series because I want to talk about it so much. This has lived in my head for so long, and it's finally well. You know, you know, the first we will have you out. back. We if if your time allows, I'd love to have you back at the at the end of it, and we can sort of do like a roundup. Oh, I would from... make time for that. Come on, thank you so. Okay, much. Okay, cool. So if you're down for it, I'm totally up for it. I'm sure my listeners will be very on board for that as well. So, I you know what, and maybe if that's true, maybe I'll we'll hold on to. I will mention her name here, Katarina Cupertino, for when we can yes. reflect on that more. I want to. I want to do. Yeah, I'm happy to do. I'm happy to. If you want to introduce some some stuff, if you have reactions to Katrina Cupertino, I'm happy to address that. But indeed, by the end of the book, it may look significantly different than from the beginning of the book. I thought that what you had said to me in our text message was super interesting, but I th- it makes sense to follow up with that later. Okay. Um, but also just, I am not inventing, ca- wrong is the only character. No. Wrong is the only character you see who I invent. Everyone else comes from, comes from the long publication histories. Yeah. No, I love that these are so many interesting pulls from from the cast, you know. I tried, man. I I, I, I super tried. I'm, you know... I figured that just had to be part of the assignment. And it's also like thrilling and fun. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I Googled that I don't have an answer to, which maybe you can speak to, is there are some words scrawled in blood on a certain door in El Salvador. Yes. Yakarta Vieni. What is that about? So I feel confident that I have written the only comic book to reference Vincent Bevan's excellent book, The Jakarta Method. The Jakarta Method is, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't read it, go out and go out and get it. This is mm-hmm. a profound work of journalism that traces the reality of anti-communist bloodshed as a concerted lessons learned process that goes from Indonesia to Brazil and then Operation Condor, which is 
the project CIA sponsored project of right wing destabilization in South America in the 1970s that will become kind of the bulldozer that clears the way of people's movements. So neoliberalism, what will become neoliberalism, starting with Pinochet, can dominate. And that's kind of what I'm one of the things that I learned from Bevins's book is that like after there's so there's a genocide in Indonesia in 1965 the, that the US is deeply involved in is basically to break the non-aligned movement of you know a whole lot of countries in, that did not want to go along with either Washington or Moscow during the Cold War and certainly in, in Indonesia Indonesia at the time was the leading country in under Sukarno in the, the non-aligned movement. And after that genocide happens, you would see in Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries when very violence, reactionary massacres against left-wing and indigenous and non-white movements would occur in the 1970s that both preceding and after to leave a message about what had gone on here the forces involved would leave messages that would say things like Jakarta Vienna, which means Jakarta is coming. In other words, the fate of hundreds of thousands in Indonesia, I'm, I, I apologize if I'm getting the number wrong off the top of my head, but this horrific fate is coming for you too if you resist us. And I've read a whole bunch of Team 7 comics. <laughs> In, in the wild storm universe and team seven is the sort of people that write that sort of message on these sorts of places. And I thought it was important to use that and also to pay tribute to how much I learned from this absolutely vital piece of journalism, the Jakarta method by Vincent Bevins. Awesome. Thank you. I'm glad I asked. I, I was too. like, I feel like I should know this, but I don't. And then the Google was like, oh, that does sort of look like the word Jakarta, but. So okay, there was cool. a version in this scene. Thank you for Googling, and I encourage others to really read this book. There was a version of this scene that absolutely did not work and we couldn't do. And that is to everyone's credit for pointing out to me that it shouldn't work this way. And then Evan and I reconceived of this scene as a moment of silent ultraviolence. There are no words on these pages when this scene occurs. Yeah. And it was important to me that there only be two words for this whole three page sequence. And those are Jakarta Vienna. Whew. That's powerful. You know, this brings me to a big picture question. Do you find that your exposure to real violence as a reporter, like how does that impact your ability to engage with media that has a lot of realistic fictional violence? Does it make it harder for you? Or like, how, how does that play with your enjoyment of things? It's a super complicated, it, the answer is super complicated. There are some things I can't watch. And like, I want to watch, or mm -hmm. I want to, yeah. You know, and usually it's, it's stuff I watch instead of stuff I read. Like, you know, I started the other night watching the new version of All Quiet on the Western Front. And I got like 15 minutes into that and was just like, I can't do this right now. Like, I, oh, I, I'm just. Yeah. And there is. When you. I'm not, you know, I didn't serve in any war, but I watched several and I didn't, you know, and I wasn't, you know, assigned. I wasn't. I didn't spend as lots of my colleagues have, you know, months or years living in a war zone, but you know, I've observed multiple wars up close multiple times. And that is, even if you don't realize it in the moment or realize it years after or realize it, you know, outside the help of therapy, a life changing experience. And it, impacts significantly what I kind of can and can't certainly as I get older and I, I drift further away from it, you know, in, 
you know, stuff I can consume, like not to get too personal, but like, you know, I, I've struggled, you know, with, you know, anxiety and depression as I assume at this point, like most of us do. And like, there were times when I would take like really violent, you know, media like with me into war zones to kill like the inevitable, you know, long periods of downtime. And I can kind of recognize that now as a mechanism of disassociation mm. that, you know, wasn't healthy and wasn't conscious. Like I watched the saw movies in Afghanistan. Like that's, that that's, a, that's a crazy and self-destructive thing to do anyway. So when I wanted to depict violence, I wanted to do so purposefully and I wanted to do so in a way of showing like how unglamorous, ugly, pitiable, lose, lose, you know, I don't deny that there are moments in which violence can be righteous, but when you see it happen up close, especially when it's not righteous, that is a profound thing that, you know, made me when I came to writing fiction, you know, I try and honor that in what it is in my journalism, no matter what. But when it came to fiction, I didn't want to be someone who wrote glamorous violence. I wanted to be someone who like made one of the, you know, and again, credit for all this, you know, goes to Jesus, but like one of the, one of the directions I, I put in this script about that sequence in El Salvador is that like, except for death blow, all of them are really into it. Like their blood is up for this. Team seven wants to be where they are right now. Like you get the sick fuckness of Deathstroke, where he's like hanging out with Bulleteer in the cockpit of the Apache helicopter when the missiles go flying. And like, I was just, when, when it, when it came time, you know, because the book can't be Lois and battalion talking over a banquet, you know, <laughs> like when it came time to have that scene, you know, I wanted it to be, like really, really ugly. I wanted it because that was what, you know, we don't say it, it can't for the timeline be the El Mazote massacre committed by U.S. trained forces in El Salvador in 1982, covered up by the Reagan administration and broken by a very intrepid journalist named Raymond Bonner. But I wanted ultimately to, you know, have it be in the minds of people who know about the dirty wars, who know about El Salvador and the history of America and El Salvador in the 1980s, have that be kind of resonant. Yeah. Yeah. Although this just feels like a very small question as a follow-up, but so is Michael speaking as a non-expert on these pieces, is Michael Cray the guy who has the blood coming out of his eyes? Or is yeah, that a different sorry. guy? It's makeup, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, that's Death Blow, Michael Cray. Classic Jim Lee, early Wildstorm creation. An early career, Tim Sale, rest in peace to the God, drew Death Blow right after Jim stopped drawing the series. And like Death Blow is a character I wanted to use because like he's he's the spec op soldier who always gets fucked. He's he's the one who has deep wells of trauma and regret over what he's made to do, over the ways that he's used, and struggles to regain his life. And when I needed someone because so much of this book is, is kind of structured like an investigation. I needed, you know, battalion who, who is the chief and he, he's what we call the inspector general of checkmate. And what that means is he's the person chartered within a government agency to investigate, you know, possible waste, fraud, and abuse. And sometimes they look at structural problems and sometimes they don't, but you know, 
he would have, you know, Battalion at that point in the story would have needed someone on the inside to to have come to him. And it made sense that, you know, not just in, in terms of like, you know, the fun of getting to to write. And I should also say the honor because, you know, this is, you know, one of those profound things rather than, you know, one of those like, you know, do this to have fun narrative choices. But to 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 write Michael Cray, you know, it felt right to me that Deathblow would be the guy who tries to blow the whistle on on this hideous rendition that he and Deathstroke perform. Also, I don't think we've ever seen. Yeah. I don't think I don't think we've ever seen Deathstroke and Deathblow together. So oh, I'm I, sure. I just loved the idea of doing that. Two death, two. Yeah, certain. exactly. Yeah, no, that that's really interesting. And and all of that was conveyed. I mean, with him getting picked up, like being clearly traumatized, like the important piece of that spoke to me, even without really really familiar with the character himself. So, well, good. Cool. I'm very I'm glad that that came through. You know, this character has not a line of dialogue in this issue. So again, like all credit. Uh, but it, you know, that's that. true. The drawing is really is really evocative. You know, there's definitely a lot of really great little moments from Hezu and like everything from like the Lonely Planet guide analog that <laughs> Michael. Oh, his fashion. As someone who thinks a lot about what people are wearing, everybody's yeah. fashion choices are really. And I shouldn't call it fashion because they're none of them are fashion, but the, the clothing that people are wearing yeah. feels really character driven and really yes, period you. appropriate. I, I, like, I, I, in the script, like one thing that never changed was that I wrote like Battalion out of the suit dresses like a dork like oh my he, God. like like yeah. beltway dork like i've but I've, like, yeah 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 which is yeah. not like a cartoon dork or not like a no, so like a certain cool. kind no. of like blue shirt you know dark blazer braided belt pants that yeah. don't match the belt like all, all all throughout like the polo but like not like super proud it's like yeah i, I know that guy. I'm i from dc i know that guy yeah, you totally so, like, know that guy and like i, I yeah. spent about like the better part of two years when I worked for Wired Magazine reporting from out of the Pentagon. And this is a certain kind of, of Pentagon guy that, yeah. I, that I saw in the hallways very often for Pentagon civilians and when, and when people were out of uniform. Yeah, yeah. And then like Lois's hats and shirts, like that's, you know, field reporting, time period appropriate, very practical. Shout out if I can to a dear friend of mine, someone who I think of as, as really a real life Lois Lane, um, Michelle Shepard, who now does really great podcasts for the CBC. And mm. for a very long time before that, and this is how I knew her, was the national security correspondent for the Toronto Star. I kept, as I have, Michelle is, is brilliant. One of just the best, the, the, the per, I always say like, Michelle is who I want to be when I grow up in my career. Mm. She, she has spent so much more time in war zones than I have. And I kept like messaging her being like, so like, I've got to write this Lois Lane thing. Like what kind of bag for what kind of period, you know, like just making sure that like, I can also like nod to, you know, choices. When Lois is in the field, she looks significantly like the first time I met Michelle, which, and we met at Guantanamo Bay. Mm, amazing yeah yeah but like you know um, when you do field reporting like you're you're kind of wearing this sort of like hopefully versatile stuff that that is definitely not stylish it's it's much more practical and like it's the kind of stuff where like when you're done with this like you you, you got to go take a shower yeah and it has all the pockets yeah pockets <laughs> crucial but like not in the image comics, Jim Lee way of pockets, but like all the pockets, but like in a normal human clothing way of all the pockets. I hadn't thought about that till just now. So many pockets. No, not that kind of pockets. <laughs> what, one of the, the most embarrassing pictures of me that hopefully you won't be able to find on the internet is a picture of me in 2010 in the hangar, in a, in a hangar with an armed drone. The army, what they would call the the Scan Eagle, which was the their service specific, you know, purchase of, of of the Predator, and I just look like an absolute dweeb. Like I'm wearing like these awful cargo pants 
above like something that are not quite sneakers and not quite boots. Like I, I, I look absolutely wretched, but like you got, you know, that kind of stuff makes a lot of sense to wear when you're mm-hmm. in environments like that. Oh yeah. No, I, uh, I can put all are... your pens and all your notebooks and your recorders. Oh yeah. I have a couple listener questions that I've decided I want to use. Okay. Um, I'm thrilled by this. Thank you like, so much. Anyone, it's, I can't believe that I'm having this conversation at all, let alone that people would write, would, would write and ask questions about it. So thank you so, so much. Yeah, no, there's a lot of enthusiasm, of course. Tyler Aiken asks, while Waller versus Wildstorm uh, is going to be set in a more grounded setting than what we've used to see in a superhero comic, but it's still a version of the DC universe. How do you write a grounded spy thriller incorporating the fantastical elements from Wildstorm while not getting lost in the scope and scale of it all? Thank you, Tyler. I wanted the circumstances that the characters face to be basically, you know, templated versions of what we're familiar with in this world and like ask how they would bounce off these fantastical worlds that in this case, I guess, is a combination of, you know, the mainline DCU and the Wildstorm U. Especially because I also needed the institutions and the characters, once we take them out of continuity, to feel, A, like themselves, recognizable from in continuity stories, and B, reflective in the ways that they internally operate their internal logic within the DC or Wildstorm universe with the circumstances that a spy thriller both requires and allows for, especially one that's, you know, trying is I think Waller versus Wildstorm is to say something about the world in which we inhabit. When I tried to avoid getting lost in the sauce by essentially just like retreating to character, one of the things that characterizes the first issue, and I don't think it'll spoil anything to say, you know, recurs throughout the miniseries is like, this is a book involving multiple perspective shifts. It is a book involving unreliable narrators, even when those unreliable narrators are A, heroic, or, you know, B, actually, let's just leave it there because I don't want to get into anything. I don't want to get into (laughs) anything else that comes up later on. Anyway, so like Battalion, for instance, as Lois susses out, is not totally telling her the full story. And it is a story that we will see challenged not only in this issue, but in subsequent issues. While at the same time, like the story that Battalion is telling, even to Lois, he's telling for a specific and in his mind, heroic reason. So when I need to get into these perspective shifts, they need to feel true to the character, even when the character is not necessarily telling the full truth. So that's kind of how I I, I approach that problem, that like we will see many instances of narratives being challenged, us as readers having information that characters in certain moments of this book do not have. And because it's a spy book, I felt like it just had to do that. And the way, like I, you know, again, limited, you know, fiction experience felt like the most natural, the most elegant way of doing that, the way that could also, you know, generate both tension and, you know, later and, and also, you know, possibly dramatic irony could come through making it like a deeply perspective focused book. And I'll just add from, you know, my perspective also is that DC has this real history of grounded spy thriller type stories in their universe. So like the DC space kind of knows how to have that pocket anyway. And, you know, for folks who haven't read the original suicide squad, well, the original eighties suicide squad, or Greg Ruck you know, now I'm sort of more getting into the checkmate. Like these are comics that feel extremely modern 
The original Suicide Squad's series, in some ways, I think is the first truly modern comic book series in the sense that- Yeah, like, I can see that. Right? It's yeah, just so completely modern. Yeah. It's it's um, if, if you want to say that Crisis is where the Bronze Age ends, mm-hmm. then yeah, I think Suicide Squad is probably the best exposition of DC after Crisis kind of resetting what its narrative ambitions could be. And yeah. Ostrander like gives us something extremely special that goes places the superhero genre did not often previously get a chance to go to. Yeah, it gets to be really dark and really raw. And I am constantly like, whoa, they got to do that about so many moments in that and also in check paint. And to me, also as someone who tends to prefer Bronze Age art to the art of the 90s and aughts, what's another great thing about Suicide Squad is that we get this incredibly modern writing feel with art that still has the best characteristics of totally. Bronze Age comics art, totally. meaning it's actually attractive. So, yeah. I like, it, I, I, I like a lot of different art styles, but that's def- I, I see what you're saying and, and completely. Right. I, I, I mean, I don't have to necessarily, like, you don't have to agree with my taste, but you get what I'm I saying. Mean, yeah. Like, or my, yeah, yeah. It, it, it has that look and polish to it. And, and it's also actually made me think about something that we were kind of talking a bit about earlier with Amanda sitting down with Battalion. Like, the story she tells Battalion about who she is is such a genius manipulation of how to relate to someone, connect with them, and then fuck them over by them having related to you and connected with you. Yeah, we're going to be turning to this a whole lot. That was, it was crucial to me that like, this is Amanda in in that scene, you know, phase, she's probably at her most institutionally vulnerable in her entire character history. She is junior in the in in the organization relative to Battalion, who at this point is like at the height of his power. And we 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 meet Amanda in a circumstance, the only scene in which we see kind of like Amanda like as the action is happening rather than Amanda as she is being talked about in the rest of that issue, have to figure out how to neutralize this much more powerful figure in one conversation. She has to, she, she, she has to, she has to essentially like, if she were a costume superhero, she has to fight battalion and win. Mm -hmm. And this is how I think, you know, in that circumstance, Amanda Waller could like manipulate a hero like, like battalion, get him unguarded. And then slip the knife in so thoroughly. I mean, it's the book is called Checkmate. Or rather, hmm. like, you know, the, the 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 book, you know, the book in the institution, you know, is called Checkmate. This ha- and it's a spy book. And it's a it's a Waller versus book. So we have to see her really play people. And we're gonna be seeing I, I, that throughout these four issues. Well I just love that she's like uses his desire to connect with her as the way to undermine him. Yes. Like his best tendency, his best personal characteristics, his best tendencies. So I, I I didn't stick with chess, but I played chess a bunch when I was younger. And, you know, you've probably heard this before, whether you have or if you haven't, you know, there are two kinds of chess players. There are players who play the board and there are players who play their opponent. And Amanda's is playing her opponent. Mm, totally. And even reading it and knowing how manipulative she is, you have this moment where you're like, wow, I definitely do see young Amanda Waller in Cabrini Green, like seeing Battalion on TV and having an emotional response to that. Like it's rooted in something real, right? But that's not the most important thing to her. It is a tool among others that she has. And her priority in that moment is to neutralize him. This guy who's come running into her black site about to, like, expose all of this. And he has to be stopped. And this is how she figures out once she starts getting him to speak. And, like, you know, if you've spent time around people who do interrogations, I don't just mean torture. I mean, you know, people who 
try and get information out of people professionally. I include reporters in this. This is, you know, a technique that we have. Right. Keep them talking. Figure out what will get them to talk and just keep them doing it. And telling people that you're a role model to them will certainly get them to talk to you. Eventually, you know, you figure out what, as you get people to talk and you listen to what they're telling you and you're trying to get at, you know, what's beneath what they're telling you, you kind of see what they come back to and you see how they can feel in battalion's weight, in battalion's case, how battalion feels the weight of being this pioneer, this black superhero, this figure within Checkmate, who's, you know, we talk a lot about ambition in that in that scene, where they talk about, you know, and this is something from, you know, the classic Wildstorm universe. This issue is called Skywatch. And we talk about Skywatch in that scene, that there is a satellite up in the sky where the highest echelons of the security state are looking down on the world. And the Italian talks about wanting to be up there and Amanda talks about wanting to be up there. And they both talk about the importance of being up there. And that's going to be something that we're going to see throughout this series. I'm excited about that. Yeah. And speaking of a young woman from Cabrini Green, I was needling my friend Eric Cleefield to give me a good question. Oh, hey, because... Eric. I used to work with him at Talking Points Memo a long time ago. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, he's also a huge fan of Judas Contract, huge Deathstroke fan. I think he's the first person who said to me, you know, Deathstroke is the Captain America of the Vietnam War. Mm, and I yeah. was like, fuck. That's a good one. Right? Yeah, okay. One. So I was like, Eric, you got to give me a question for Spencer. And he took a minute and then he gave me this, which I'm fucking, you know, basically, I, I, re I reworded this a bit, but um, okay. So Chicago mayoral runoff is April 4th. Oh we got it between Paul Vallis, who is a CEO, a school privatizer. He's funded by cops. He says racist shit all the time. He's up against Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson, former teacher turned union organizer. Amanda Waller's from Cabrini Green. Who, who would she vote for in this election? She's going to vote for whoever's getting her the better deal to what she's trying to accomplish in that moment. And, you know, Chicago politics is not an idealistic place, no. uh, <laughs> to, to say the least. Chicago politics is real raw, and, you know, exercises of power are what we are constantly told is the most important factor in shaping outcomes. So, I don't know, I kind of think, you know... Amanda's going to go with Valley with Valis on this one. I, I I should also yeah you know I should also say that like I haven't really paid attention to this election, so yeah you know, please take that <laughs> please I you know no, it's, don't we, li me. we live in New York yeah. all the Chicago people are like shut up New Yorker but no I I yeah I really think as much as we see from the very first pages in which she's introduced in Legends Amanda Waller like calls out racism when directed at her. Amanda Waller wants funding for her police state programs, and she will definitely vote for Fall Vallis, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, this is, um, yeah. Um, Amanda Waller at times can be an avatar for a very real politics of national security, politics of, of police power, politics of, of law enforcement, and politics of broad national prerogatives that have profound consequences, often for people who look like Amanda Waller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They come from circumstances that she came from, and that's a that's that's just a that's just a fact of 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 the political landscape. Totally. Hey, kids, don't forget to vote in the Chicago runoff April 4th. <laughs> <laughs> There's also, I think, a big judicial elections in Wisconsin. I'm always reminding people about voting in their local elections. That's like no, one of my hobbies. Definitely. And so the last listener question I wanted to share is from Jason Kim. I'm going to write this. This is like as he spoke it. Jason Kim says, in a lot of late Cold War era media, it seems to me the focus tends to be on the Eastern Bloc. How much focus is there going to be on the under-discussed dictatorships propped up by American support, prompted by the thought that the memory of South Korea in the modern American memory, in my experience, is framed as the great democratic success story, while the cyclical nature of autocracy and democracy post-Korean War feels invisible if you're not in the Korean diaspora? Now, 
we kind of already answered the first piece of this by talking about the story taking place in Southeast Asia. But I thought the the point of his question around the difference in how these stories are told between Eastern Bloc and specifically vis-a-vis Korea as well, I thought was really interesting to me. Indeed. And thank you for the question, Jason. Yeah, this is going to be entirely about the West what the West does. We're we're at the moment of the US led Western capitalist coalition's total triumph. This is this is where this is where the dog catches the car. And it's it's about what happens once that happens, what happens once you know those ambitions are finally realized, and we can look at it on both the terms that their architects set out and the terms that we understand them 30 odd years later, what their works have been in addition to what their architects intended. You know, like we said before, I, you know, I didn't want to really go in to specific countries because of the risk of, of particularization. South Korea would have been, if I could have set this story in the, in the early Cold War, I would have definitely done that. Someone will come up with a way to do that for these characters that, that I did not. And that would be a very rich choice particularly you know knowing what we now know about long covered up massacres that US and allied forces committed in Korea to explore yeah yeah and and not just that like the dis- the the you know south korea is a young democracy its democracy gets going a against the interests of the united states B, with resistance consistently over the years from the the end of the Korean War until, you know, um, Kim Dae-young and his his colleagues in the in the 1980s democracy movement against the interests of those and, and with like tremendous, you know, crackdowns from those whom the United States props up to make sure they rule South Korea in the interests of 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 the of Cold War capitalism. So that would be definitely a very rich narrative vein. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <sighs> well, thank you again for coming on the show. I'm so excited we got to talk about this. I'm excited we're going to get to talk about it again. Thank you to folks who sent in their questions. And, you know, a number of people have asked me, like, what's the best way to support the comic? And th- the answer is to go buy it please, in print. I- <laughs> please buy it. Please I know, buy, buy it in print. It matters. I mean, I know we only have so much shelf space, but it's only going to be four issues. Like you have space for that, you know. Please, please. I would really like this to be a collection. And like this cover, this first cover, oh. like the, the pulp 1970. And I know you have a lot of variants too, but the main one with like the 1970 action movie sort of like pulp cover painting is just so fun. Yeah. Let me just stickers. sing to the, the heavens the praises of, of you know, Jorge Fornas who, who did that that cover and who's doing covers, who's doing the main covers for the rest of the book. In addition to my friend, Eric Battle, who's doing the, the variant, who's doing the mainline variant covers. But Jorge, I got to see him at New York Comic Con and just thank him profusely. That cover set the tone for the book. And, and we've, we've run with it since. Um, And I'm so grateful for that. And I'm really grateful for you, Alana. I've been looking forward to having this conversation for literally years at this point. <laughs> so I'm, I'm grateful for you for doing that. Well, very much for everyone who wrote in and let me just praise like in a way that as a, you know, a comic, a longtime comics reader, I kind of understood, but until I started doing this, you know, didn't really appreciate comics is really a team sport. You know, there's, at a certain point, you know, I, I might want to, you know, catalog all of the great ideas. I know I've talked about this a lot from my perspective, but all of the great ideas in this issue and every subsequent one, like major ideas contributed by Evan, who made this book really sing, who who brought his, I think, you know, powerful perspective and voice into this book and kept me from going off the rails definitely kept me coherent throughout, you know, this issue and subsequent and 
every subsequent one. And in addition, just the unbelievable work that Jesus and Michael do on, on, on the art in this book is, is just stunning. And I've seen what, what hasn't yet been published for, for what they've got coming. And I'm so excited. Yeah. Issue, issue one of Waller versus Wildstorm, I think is setting up something that I hope will be memorable. And, and that's all I should say. <laughs> Yes. And it's been a blast and it's given me, you know, so many other fun things to spin off and read with. So folks should definitely have a good time with it and remind our listeners the best way to keep up with your work, including your newsletter. Oh yes. I am trying, I, I'm going to be on social media, you know, to promote Waller versus Wildstorm. That means Twitter and Instagram. My handle is at attackerman. The paperback of Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized American Produced Trump, is in stores. I have a newsletter for the newsletter published by the newsletter company Ghost called Forever Wars. That's found at foreverwars.ghost.io. So if you subscribe to Forever Wars, I will be grateful. And also, like, that's at this point, like, my most consistent way of communicating both random thoughts and the current journalism that I'm doing. And I'm also for sure going to be talking about Waller versus Wildstorm and process stuff about that a lot. And also by the time this episode comes out, I am a newly minted columnist for The Nation magazine, a publication I have a great deal of respect for as the Institute yeah. for um, History of the American Left in Journalism. And my first column will be out by the time that this interview comes out. And so please go pick that up. It's going to be about the legacy of the Iraq war and what we owe to Iraqis. And much, oh, damn. And much like a comic book, the nation magazine fits in your bag. Very, very neatly. Very neatly. Although I would never bag and board an issue of the nation, even the ones that I've had stuff in. <laughs> I used to fold them into quadrants to fit them in my purse totally. back when I, not comics, totally the nation back when I, back when I used to have hey, a purse. Look, sometimes you got to fit something discreetly when you're on your way to the bathroom in a public place. Here you go. So, you know. As for me, I continue to be on Twitter until it implodes, I suppose. <laughs> E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. I will probably remember to use my Mastodon at some point in the future, but as we like to say on the podcast, Keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at Graphic Policy. Dot com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.